I um I read with some sadness about the passing of Norman Jewison. And uh, Norman Jewison, an incredibly important director from the standpoint, I guess, both of the film industry and also of the social causes that he seemed touched by. I asked Ben Mankiewicz from Turner Classic Movies to join us for just a couple of minutes to talk about Norman Jewison. He passed away at 97, and uh, Ben agreed uh, last minute to be here. So how about it for Ben Mankiewicz, everybody? <laughs> Hi there, Ben. Hey, how are you? Uh, can you All right, thank, I thank you. Computer. I'm making sure everything's working, but you can hear me. I'm good. Yeah, uh, Albert, are you, are you good with Ben right now? Albert is the, uh, is the grand poobah on this show. Yeah, I'll just Are be you, writing his levels. You sound great, Ben. All right. Okay. Albert, thank you. All right. Uh, ben, Norman Jewison, I think of him in the heat of the night, uh, Cincinnati kid. Uh, he was important. Fiddler on the roof, I guess. There he is. Tell me about the impact of Norman Jewison. Who was he as a director? Well, I think his impact is, uh, you know, considerable. He came into the business a, a little bit before the new Hollywood, which, you know, for all intents and purposes started in 1967. Uh, you know, the Cincinnati kid came before that. He, he did a couple of Doris Day movies, but the Cincinnati kid was really a breakthrough uh, for him. You know, I don't think he gets in the heat of the night, which was 1967, one of the seminal films of 67 um, uh, without the Cincinnati kid. You know, there's a he famously told Hal Ashby, who was one of the great directors of the 1970s, Hal Ashby had seven films in nine years. They're all really top tier pictures. Uh, and Ashby was Norman's editor. And I, I Ashby flamed out in part because he used a tremendous amount of drugs <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. in part because he couldn't reconcile dealing with the people who had the money with producers with suits right and and basically what norman had said to hal was you know always remember the you know the suits are our enemy but norman like martin scorsese like a little bit later steven spielberg you know he figured it out he figured out how to maintain this independent voice and stand up for movies and stories that he believed in without blowing himself up and how Ashby had an unbelievable seven picture run over nine years, but he couldn't, he couldn't pull himself to get along with the people who were going to hire him and pay him. And so Norman had this gift because he was such a gentle, wonderful man. I interviewed him a number of times, really long form interviews, spent a long time with him, had meals with him. And he was just so kind. And, he, you know, he, he like had the, he had the brain and heart of a radical but the sensibility to figure out like, Hey man, I'm making movies and I, I'm going to have to work for these studios at some point. So um, he was sort of an exception in that he, he figured it out. And it's one of the things I really admired about him. In the heat of the night was a film and is a film. That's one of the great things about film is that it just endures. So it's still there and it, it's impactful today. There was a bunch of stuff I saw in the heat of the night, you know, many years ago, but then I saw it again at one of your festivals, the TCM Festival, and Sidney Poitier, who's, you know, critical part in the film, obviously, lead in the movie, uh, he was there. And I just was, again, reminded of how breakthrough that movie was in so many different ways. And it took, even as it took head on, uh, the issue of racism in the South. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, the, the the film was in a significant breakthrough film. Hang on a second. Uh, Albert, that is In the Heat of the Night, the TV show. Okay, that's a picture of the TV show. There's In the Heat of the Night with Sidney Poitier, Rod Steiger. You want yeah. the film. Sorry, Lee, Ben. Lee Grant. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Albert, thank you. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Go ahead, was, That was uh, Harold Rollins and Carol O'Connor in the TV show, which was, of course, successful and because the movie had been so successful. So, I mean, it's sure. The, the, the television show grew out of that. Um, and uh, so 1967, you know, this was, uh, you know, uh, the heat and heart of the civil rights movement. Um, and, you know, there, there were there were certainly some really thoughtful people who had some criticism of the movie, like James Baldwin, who thought, you know, this portrayal of a, of a, a northern black man in the South 
is preposterous, I think were the, was the words James Baldwin used. But that said, the movie was a breakthrough film. I, I think it's really quite amazing to watch today. Uh, you know, white people took this story of, you know, friendship that, hey, look, can't we all get along, which is what we always wanted to take from these movies. Like, everything will be fine, right? I think yeah. black people saw these movies a little differently, quite understandably. But nonetheless, there's still some real breakthrough moments of it. The, the real hero of the story is Poitier, right, who's in the South visiting family um, uh, when he is suddenly accused of committing this murder in this small town merely because he's a black guy in a suit in town and then it turns out he's a skilled he's the smartest person in every room he's in right he knows a lot more about investigating murders because he's a homicide detective in philadelphia and and things are fairly primitive in this small town and and, and rod steiger as the as the chief of police there you know eventually comes to be, very begrudgingly accept him but the most powerful moment in the film involves poitier and another actor a guy named larry gates character actor uh, and and he's the big powerful landowner. He doesn't like being talked to during the investigation the way Poitier is talking to him. Poitier plays Virgil Tibbs, and and uh, and Gillespie is there, the Rod Steiger character. And he and then get Larry Gates, this powerful business owner, wealthy man in town, he slaps Poitier. And I always describe it like this: Poitier returns the slap, which he worked on with Norman Jewison, right? And uh, and Poitier was like, "Don't," Jewison told him, "Don't slap him in the ear." Slap him in the face, right? Make sure you get the face. Um, and two things I love about that. One, I always describe it as there's no, you can't on a stopwatch record the limited amount of time it takes for Poitier to return the slap. It's not like, bam, bam, it's bam, bam. Right, Poitier's like, oh, you slap me, I'm gonna slap you back harder. And and Gates then turns to, to Gillespie, the chief of police uh, played by Steiger, and he says, like, did you see that? And Steiger is just looking as, you know, such a good actor and his eyes are wide. And he's like, I saw it. Like, he was just like, I've never seen anything like it. And, and Poitier, you know, the, he of course, he steals the scene. He steals every scene. Uh, another great scene with the wonderful actress, Lee Grant. Well, Norma Jewison really, Lee Grant tweeted about this uh, after his death. She was blacklisted, as I, I guess I understand. And, and, and she, she, this was her return after being blacklisted. She was really blacklisted because her husband had been a communist. And, uh, and because the, her, uh, uh, Arnold Manhoff was her husband, Arnie Manhoff and, uh, Diana Manhoff is her daughter and from, uh, you know, uh, soap, I think, right. She was so great on soap. And, uh, but Lee, um, there's a scene where her husband is the murder victim in he of the night. And there's a scene with her and Poitier. They're, they're in the chief's office. There's two of them. He's trying to talk to her, get some information, early stages of the murder investigation. She's trying to reconcile that her husband has been murdered. And he wants to touch her to comfort her. But there's this, it's uns, all of it's unspoken. He knows he can't really touch her because he's a black man in the South in 1967. She's not only a white woman, she's a white woman of privilege. And she kind of wants to be comforted, but she's not comfortable letting him touch. And she's also just freaking out. And the two of them, being such incredibly skilled actresses, actors. Um, it's just a really great 85 second scene, right? I mean, it's as good as acting gets and there really aren't that many words exchanged. Um, it's, it's, by the way, you, 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 uh, I love that you underscore that because just like the slap, the movie's made up of these inflection moments, you know? Right. And by the way, the slap, I learned this, I think at your festival, the TCM festival, that was Poitier in the moment reacting to it. That wasn't in the script originally. I believe that's right. Norman said otherwise. Norman okay. said it was in the script, and so I, I would I would defer to Norman. They they certainly worked on it. I mean, you know, memories okay. on this kind of thing. First of all, we could find out by the scripts are available, but you know, Norman remembers talking about it, working on it with Poitier. That I see. Okay, would have taken place. Yeah. Whether whoever whose ever idea it was the notion that Poitier in 1967 before, I don't know exactly when it was shot, you know, maybe late 66 would have said, I'm going to slap this guy. I actually find hard to believe, but if anybody would have done that, it was Poitier. And, uh, you know, he's one, he made three movies that year. Poitier did uh, in the heat of the night, guess who's coming to dinner and to serve with love. He was not nominated for best actor, but if they gave the award for best year, right. <laughs> Well, uh, and, and the other the five, just I want to 1967 is like maybe the greatest year for best actors. Poitier wasn't nominated, 
And then there's Paul Newman and Cool Hand Luke and Dustin Hoffman and the graduate and Warren Beatty in Bonnie and Clyde and Spencer Tracy in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and Rod Steiger in The Heat of the Night Who Won. Well, you mentioned The Graduate. The Graduate is what took the director's Oscar, if you want to put it this way, from Norman Jewison that you were talking about. He was nominated against Mike Nichols, who won for The Graduate that year. Yeah, and any, um, any, any of those directors of those movies I just mentioned really, really could have won. You know? Sure, thank you, uh, it's yeah. It's really unbelievable. That's why the that. Oscars are just what they are. You know, I mean, it's tough to compare this stuff. Uh, by the way, Norman Jewison was not Jewish. Boy, that's the best part about it. I mean, that's the best story about Norman is the... So like in 19, what? United, Heart, United Artists hires him to uh, to direct Fiddler on the Roof, right? Which had been this unbelievably wildly successful Broadway play and then international play. And then finally they're going to turn it into a movie and they can't quite figure out how you're going to turn this into a movie. And they and they hire, they're like, well, Norman Jewish, <laughs> he'll be able to. The guy didn't either. <laughs> and he's at the meeting. I think Arthur Krim was the head of United Artists. I hope I have the name right there. And they're, <laughs> they're, and Norman realizes some minutes into the meeting, and he's like, hmm, "You know, fellows, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> I'm just named Jewish. Just a name in Canada. You know, he's Canadian." Norman. He was Methodist. The yeah, family was Methodist. And, and they, but he, yeah, they, go they, ahead. He, they, he acted like they were like, "Oh, no, of course we know that." But he's like, hey, <laughs> definitely, "Definitely thought I was Jewish." Yeah, yeah. That's great. He says that like. A lot of his childhood, because of that name, was informed by you know intense prejudice and anti-Semitism. You know, even though yeah. he was not, and and yeah, he uh, said he totally experienced it, and he, and he was always so great about it because he he always made it clear like the anti-Semitism I experienced made me perhaps more sensitive to it, more understanding of it. That maybe a kid might have been. I hope I'd have been that way. Obviously, it wasn't the same as actually being Jewish. Like he was always like, I'm not, you know, I'm not telling you I suffered in that way, but I I caught a a glimpse of it, even in Canada. Uh, as we finish up, he did Moonstruck with Cher. I mean, he did quite, there was a breadth of work there in Norman Jewison's cinematic life, right? Oh, yeah, he was, he was like, he's like Howard Hawks. He's like Michael Curtiz, this guy, they could, any kind of movie. He just knew how to tell a story that would relate to people. Um, I tell one quick Moonstruck story. Please. So one of the great things about Moonstruck is one of my favorite movies. A lot of, I mean, it's hard to watch Moonstruck and not love it like moment after moment after moment that just feels so incredibly authentic, right? It's unbelievable cast from, you know, the Theodore Chaliapin, who plays the grandfather to, you know, to obviously Olympia Dukakis won an Oscar and the aunts and uncles, you know, Julie Babasso and Louis Gus, all, all these guys. And uh, um, so, uh, but we're uh, Vincent Gardenia as, as Cher's mom, Cher's father. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> but the movie, like the studio knows it's good, right? They're sure they got a hit. It's funny. They got Jewish and he's at his strength that share. They got share to do it. She didn't want to do it because she'd been so busy. She insisted on Nicolas Cage. Everything's perfect. The casting, everything is ideal. John Mahoney's go great in this movie too. And then, but in the beginning of the movie, we're meeting the family, this extended family lives in Brooklyn. And uh, we don't, um, and for whatever reason, through the first half hour of the movie, this movie, the studio knows is funny. Jewison knows. Everyone knows it's funny. And they're screening it. And they don't get any laughs. And they're like, we're never this wrong. We know it's good. We see it. We're good. And it's funny. And the movie opera plays a big part of the movie, like the passion of opera. And that's what brings Cage and Cher together. They go to the opera on a date. and But they're playing opera music at the beginning of the movie, right? Because it makes sense. Um, and... And but the opera music, as these family was trading insults, which are funny, told them that maybe it wasn't supposed to be funny. Like maybe this was a family that had deep seated anger at each other. And so they weren't laughing. And the only thing they changed was they took that opera music out of the beginning and they replaced it after those test screenings. That's why test screenings matter. And it's not just, you know, somebody saying to Pablo Picasso, hey, too much blue, Pablo. You know, it's not right. right. It has value. All they do is take that out and replace it with uh, Dean Martin doing that some more. And that little change, they screen it again, every laugh lands, it becomes this giant wow. huge hit. Um, because it telegraphed that, no, this is like, this is okay. She's not really actually angry at her father-in-law. She loves That's it. That's wild, yeah. wild. Yeah. Well, those kinds of anecdotes and more from 
the great Ben Mankiewicz. By the way, Albert, how can Ben hear me right now without wearing these huge headphones that I'm forced to wear? He looks so good. And, you know, he's got the great hair and everything. And you can see it without headphones because he's not. What are you using to be able to hear me right now, Ben? I'm just hearing it through the computer. I got this new computer, and I don't even think this mic is that I'm talking into, this very expensive microphone. No, it's not working. Yeah, you're, you're, not, we're hearing you through the computer. Right. It's yeah. not working because I, I haven't got it, I don't know, somehow set up, and your your yeah. your link is new. But I, this, they figured this out on the on the Zooms and the, and the Zoom. I other, see. You don't oh, have wow. to have it. You can hear it without getting the feedback. I think you may have helped me with a breakthrough here. I've got to um, – we are going to change this. I don't like the big heavy cans. But uh, uh, come back and uh, mention your podcast, and we can talk more about that, which I think is a really a cool thing. It's called the episode that dropped yesterday, Talking Pictures. With the uh, episode one was Nancy Myers. Yesterday's uh, uh, Stephen Soderbergh, just talking about wow. the movies they've made and the movies they love. It's great, great it's stuff. Good. Yeah, what? it's a great, yeah, great podcast. So we'll come back and talk more about that. Thanks, Ben Mankiewicz. Thank you, guys. Rest in peace, Norman Jewison. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.